pages called The Slush Pile Gave Me Writer's Block. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope you bear with me. It's well. Um yeah. Everything was fine until I started reading unsolicited manuscripts. <laughs> Dear Caravan, I'm a writer as, though as of yet unpublished, I've written stuff I'm deeply ashamed of. A novel <laughs> almost ten years back that was horrid. And I've written stuff I genuinely like. A few years ago I sent a collection of flash fiction stories to a publisher, and although it didn't want to publish them, it replied with a personal letter in which it told me what worked and what didn't. A personal letter is a really big thing. So I was beyond thrilled, but then I made a huge mistake. I went to work in a small publishing firm, and during my time there became familiar with the slush pile. <laughs> I should note that we don't use agents in my country, so people submit directly to the publisher. Hence the slush pile is one huge, ugly, throbbing pile of big dreams and bad writing. <laughs> and these people have no idea how bad they are. Working at the publishing firm, I started worrying about my own skills as a writer and became unable to write anything for the next couple of years. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Thankfully, I've almost conquered the block now. This year, I finally finished an old short story and I started working on a new novel. Um, so usually when I read these, I don't read the whole letter. Um, oh, okay, so here it is, though. As I'm writing, I keep hearing my imaginary but very literary reader saying, this stuff is totally unbelievable. My big question is, how do you believe in your own writing? I don't mean after it's finished, but while you're writing it. Is there a way to work with the imaginary reader instead of fighting it? Thank you, sign the slusher. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I said, dear slusher, you will learn generosity toward your own work by becoming more generous to others. In the slush pile are the souls of people. They're perhaps badly dressed, but they are the souls of people, high and low. Honor them. Yes, I know that much writing one will encounter in the slush pile will lack certain elements of organization and will employ devices that have not been reworked sufficiently to entertain us or do not show the marks of fine craftsmanship in years of study. But why should that bother us? All the author has done is re render a work with a skill that we deem insufficient. What business do we have getting angry at such a person or scoffing or denouncing? We say, oh, this person is so intolerably presumptuous as to assume that she can produce a work of fiction. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this person has no idea how hard it is, how many years it takes, how dare she. I, I think that anger comes from a fear of seeing ourselves in that work. We see ourselves as possibly inferior, and we protect ourselves from that possibility by puffing up our scorn. It's the bluster of a frightened ego. It has nothing to do with our talent. I should say this, too, right up front. The operative question is not how do we believe in ourselves, but how do we go forward? If you create this condition that you must believe in yourself to go forward, you might not go forward. You must find a way to go forward without that condition. You do not have to believe in yourself. You just need to find a way to move forward. Okay, so this is what happened to me. Okay, it had to do with my dad. So it's about 1993 or 1994, and I'm doing a series of magazine assignments for Details Magazine about rock bands. And each time I do a piece, it gets accepted, and I get paid, but it doesn't run. And I'm maybe four or five years sober, I'm working a shit job. Not, not the shit Chevron job, that was, this is a real shit job. <laughs> they hate me and stick me in a windowless room addressing envelopes by hand. 
So I'm trying to do the free line saying I'm having these heart palpitations, panic attacks, and I have to call my editor. The phrasing sort of freaks me out now. But anyway, the one thing about my shit job is it has health insurance and employee assistance at program. So for the first time in my life, I go see a therapist. So I went through this quick session, and I just all spills out. I go, long and short of it is, we get to my problem that I can't pick up the telephone and call my editor. So we get around to is my dad. So I'm thinking my dad is not a frightening man. He's my dad. He's on my side. So we talk about these little voices in my head that say I can't write. Turns out these little voices in my head that say I can't write sound a lot like my dad. <laughs> Not that it's my dad talking, but I've interjected my dad's disapproval. Being a son, I thought it was immune. So I'm sort of editing as I go. <laughs> So it turned out I was actually living in fear of the judgment of others, and more importantly, actually living in fear of my own judgment. So when we judge others harshly, we run the risk of internalizing this fear. We cannot judge harshly without also living in fear of being judged, and it's that creeping fear of being judged ourselves that can prevent us from writing fluidly and with ease. Courage. So I say step out there and be really, really bad if you want. Write the worst prose imaginable. Do it with gusto. <laughs> Write poems that are so bad you can smell them. <laughs> well, this is. So, therefore, we celebrate writing, all writing, we celebrate it. Let the taboos against bad writing fall, let the barriers be down, let the sharp-tongued English teachers take their seats, and let us do what we do, and let those who would judge us go ahead and judge us. We don't care, we're going to do it anyway, let them proclaim us as the dirty, unskilled urchins of their nightmares. We're not living to please them. I used to think I was on top, looking down on all that was awful. Now I feel I'm on the bottom of the sea, looking up at everything that is marvelous. So let us dance, all of us, together on the bottom of the sea. <laughs>